morning guys so you just finished watching Sacagawea on vocabulary so this was the story from the journeys book that I'm going to read to you I know you don't have your journeys book but I do have this PDF form so that we can follow through all right so it is the early 1800s teenaged Sacagawea is a Shoshone Indian living in the Knife River villages in what is now North Dakota when she was a child, Hidatsa Indians kidnapped her from her home in the Rocky Mountains. Since then, she has lived with them on the Great Plains, far from her family. She has learned many things from this group, including how to grow food. She is now married to a French-Canadian fur trapper named um, Carboneau. Meanwhile, Captains Mary Weather, Lewis, and William Clark have been preparing for the Corps of Discovery. They and their team, which include a large black Newfoundland, Newf Newfoundland dog, are about to start a long journey of exploration all the way to the Pacific Ocean. On May 14, 1804, a crew of more than 40 men set off against the Missouri River current in a keelboat and two large canoes called Piros. The Corps of Discovery was underway. The expedition arrived at the Knife River villages at the end of October. They were greeted with great excitement. Sacagawea heard tales of a gigantic black dog that traveled with the explorers. She heard that a fierce and awesome white man with black skin was among the crew. This was York, the slave of Captain Clark. The explorers built a fort and called it Fort Mandan. Then they settled in to spend the winter at the Knife River villages. Lewis and Clark soon learned they would need horses to cross the Rocky Mountains. The people of the villages told them they could get the horses from the Shoshone when the expedition reached the mountain passes. Okay, and here's a drawing. Okay. The Wally <clears throat> Charbonneau proposed that they hire him as a guide and interpreter. He did not speak Shoshone, but Sagawija did. He told her they would be joining the Corps of Discovery in the spring. This was exciting news, but Sacagawea's mind was on other matters. She was soon to become a mother. In February, the time came for Sacagawea to have her baby. It was a long, difficult birth. Captain Lewis wanted to help her. He gave a crew member two rattlesnake rattles to crush and mix with water. Just a few minutes after drinking the mixture, Sacagawea gave birth to a baby boy. He was named Jean Baptiste Carbonell, but Captain Clark called him Pompey. Before long, the boy was known to everyone as Pump. On April 7, 1805, the Corps of Discovery started west, struggling upstream on the mighty, muddy Missouri in two pirogues and six smaller canoes. Pomp was not yet two months old. As Sacagawea walked along the riverbank, she carried Pomp on her back in a cradleboard or wrapped up snug in her shawl. Every member of the Corps of Discovery was hired for a special skill. Hunter, blacksmith, woodsman, sailor. As an interpreter, Carboneau was paid much more than the other crew members. But his skills as a sailor, guide, and outdoorsman were very poor. The only thing he did well was cook buffalo sausage. Sacagawea did what she could to help the expedition, even though she was paid nothing. As she walked along the shore with Captain Clark, she looked for plants to keep the crew healthy. She gathered berries or dug for wild artichoke roots with her digging stick. Her childhood had prepared her well for this journey. The Corps had been traveling less than two months when near disaster struck. Carboneau was steering a boat through choppy waters when a sudden high wind tipped it sideways. He lost his wits and dropped the rudder while the boat filled with water. The expedition's valuables were spilling overboard. Carboneau was ordered to right the boat or be shot. Hmm. Okay, and here she is carrying the baby. Okay. Sacagawea stayed calm and rescued the captain's important things. Journals, gunpowder, medicines, scientific instruments, every bundle she could reach. Without these supplies, the expedition could not have continued. A few days later, they came to a beautiful river. The grateful captains named it after Sacagawea. 
By June, the Corps was entering mountain country. Soon they could hear the distant roaring sound of the great falls of the Missouri. Captain Lewis thought the waterfall was the greatest sight he had ever seen, but there was no way to get past it by boat. It would take the Corps nearly a month to get around the Great Falls and the four waterfalls they found just beyond it. The crew built creaky, clumsy wagons to carry their boats and supplies. Battered by hail, rain, and wind, the men dragged the wagons over sharp rocks and prickly pear cactus that punctured their moccasins. One day, a freak cloudburst caused a flash flood. Rocks, mud, and water came crashing down the canyon. Sacagawea held on to her son as tight as she could while Clark pushed and pulled them both to safety. Pomp's cradleboard, clothes, and bedding were swept away by the rushing water, but all three were unharmed. By the middle of July, the, the Corps was once again paddling up the Missouri. They reached a valley where three rivers came together, a place Sacagawea knew well. If she was upset to see it again, she did not show it. The captains learned how Sacagawea had been captured and her people killed. Sacagawea recognized a landmark that her people called the Beaverhead Mountain. She knew they must be nearing the summer camp of the Shoshone. Okay. And here's another picture. Nearly two weeks later, Sacagawea walked along the river, scanning the familiar territory. She spotted some men on horseback far ahead of them. Suddenly, Captain Clark saw Sacagawea dance up and down with happiness, sucking her fingers. He knew this sign meant that these were her people, the, the Shoshone. An excited crowd greeted the explorers at the Shoshone camp. Other years had passed since Sacagawea had been captured. A Shoshone woman recognized her. She rushed up to Sacagawea and threw her arms around her. Lewis and Clark had discovered that their need for Shoshone horses was even greater than they thought. There was more mountain country between the Missouri River and a water route to the Pacific than they expected. A Grand Castle Council was called to discuss the matter. Sacagawea was to be one of the translators. Interpreting for the men at the chief's council was a serious responsibility. She wanted to do her best, but when she looked at the face of the Shoshone chief, she burst into tears. He was her brother. She jumped up, threw her blanket over her brother, and wept. He was moved also, but the council had to continue. Though tears kept flooding back, she kept to her duty until the council ended. Sacagawea spent the last days of August with her people. The time passed too quickly. Before long, the expedition had to mount Shoshan horses and continue across the mountains, leaving their boats behind. The next part of their journey almost killed them. The mountain paths were narrow and dangerous, especially once it started to snow. Their feet froze, they didn't have enough to eat, and the mountains seemed without end. Finally, the expedition emerged on the Pacific side of the Rockies. There, Nez Perce Indians helped them make new boats and agreed to keep the horses in case they returned the way in spring. With great relief, the crew dropped their boats into the Clearwater River and let the current carry the expedition toward the ocean. At the beginning of November, the explorers noticed a sound that could only be the crashing of waves. They had finally reached the Pacific Ocean. The crew voted on where to make winter camp. Sacagawea was allowed to vote too. She wanted to stay where she could find plenty of Wapatu roots for winter food. They set up camp not far from the ocean in case a ship came to take them back home. But by now, people back east were sure the whole corpse was long dead. No ship came for them. A cold rain soaked the crew as they cut logs and built Fort Clatstop. The hunters went to find game while Sacagawea dug for Wapatu roots in the soggy ground. Christmas Day was rainy and dreary, but the Corps was determined to celebrate. The men fired a salute with their guns and sang. Sacagawea gave Captain Clark a fine gift of two dozen white weasel tails. In early January, Clark heard from some Indians that a whale had washed up on shore. He decided to go to the ocean to get blubber for the crew to eat. They were tired of their diet of lean, spoiled meat and fish. Sacagawea gathered up her courage and insisted that she be allowed to accompany Clark. She hadn't traveled so far to leave without ever seeing the ocean, 
and she wanted to see that mon mon monstrous creature, monstrous creature. The captain agreed to let her go. At last, she saw the Pacific Ocean. She stood and stared at the great waters stretching endlessly in front of her. On the beach was the great skeleton of the whale. It was an amazing sight, nearly as long as twenty men lying end to end. The whale had been picked clean, but Clark was able to buy some blubber from the Indians to feed his men. The crew stayed busy all winter hunting, selling moccasins, and making repairs on the equipment. Clark made maps while Lewis worked on his report to President Jefferson. Sacagawea watched over Pomp as he began to walk. Captain Clark called him my little dancing boy. He had become very attached to Sac Sacagawea and her son. When the time came, it would be hard for them to part. Spring arrived, and it was time to go back the way they had come. In late March, the Corps of Discovery headed up the Columbia River to retrieve their horses from the Nez Perez. At a place called Traveler's Rest, the expedition divided into two groups. Sacagawea would help guide Clark's group south to the Yellowstone River. Lewis's group would head northeast to explore the Marias River. At the end of July, Clark's group came across an enormous rock tower on the banks of the Yellowstone. Clark named it Pompey's Tower in honor of his beloved little friend. In the side of the rock, he carved this. Two groups, the two groups met up on August 12th. Two days later, Sacagawea gazed once again upon the round earth lodges of the Knife River villages. She had been gone over a year and four months. Lewis and Clark prepared to return to St. Louis. Before they left, Captain Clark came to talk to Sacagawea and her husband. He offered to take Pomp back to St. Louis with him. He would see that the boy had a good education and would raise him as his own. Wonder what she's going to do. Sacagawea knew that Captain Clark would take good care of her child, but he was not even two years old. She couldn't let him go yet. Sacagawea and her husband promised they would bring Pomp to visit Clark in a year or so. On August 17, 1806, Sacagawea watched as the Corps of Discovery set off again down the Missouri River. Her journey of exploration was over, but the Corps of Discovery still had hundreds of miles to go.